So thank you very much to the organizers for organizing, for the invitation to come to such a beautiful place at such a lovely time of the year. Um, so um, as Michael said, I'm going to give I, what I hope is really an introductory talk, assuming that, so that I won't assume uh, too much about uh, that you know more than you do. Please stop me if I'm, I'm using terms or, or anything, say anything that's completely, that's, that's, uh, that needs explanation. Um, so uh, you said, how did you put it, uh, an introductory talk to astrophysics or to astro long range interactions in an astrophysical setting. So I'm going to give that a, a fairly tight uh, interpretation. I'm going to be talking about gravity, right? So obviously, long range interactions, uh, you know, in plasmas and so on can be very important in an astrophysical setting. There are lots of, you know, it's not necessarily just uh, gravity, uh, but I'm going to be talking about just gravity. And further, okay, astrophysics, I always feel a little bit at, ill at ease as being described as an astrophysicist because I don't really consider myself to be uh, an astrophysicist in the sense that I don't know anything about star formation or not very much about galaxy formation even. Uh, I'm more a cosmologist, let's say, in, when one looks at the closer structure, um, astrophysics and cosmology are two domains that kind of talk very closely to one another, but they are uh, quite, uh, they can function quite separately as well. I'm more, my, my field, my background is more cosmology, and I've also been interested in the long range long-range interactions and statistical mechanics of long-range interactions in the last couple of years. So um, basically, so I'm going to focus on gravity the f uh, and uh, in the cosmological setting. So the interest of the cosmological problem, I'm not sure, I'm further on in my talk, uh, or tomorrow I'll try and make some connections to some problems that have already been mentioned and uh, to things in long-range interactions, problems that are of relevance in other long-range interactions. But uh, the problem I get to talk about is this very specific cosmological problem of uh, formation of structure in the universe. And uh, so I want to just, my, my, so my plan is that I will spend uh, uh, one and a half, uh, one and a half uh, hours, or uh, I won't, speak the whole, whole hour, but one and a half session talking about giving this introduction to the problem of structure formation. And then in the last half an hour, so I, I was given some leeway to talk about things that are closer to my own work. I will probably, if I have the, the time, uh, talk about some uh, simple uh, models which are closer to statistical models that people study in statistical mechanics, which are very nice models, uh, I think, for maybe both astrophysics and cosmology for trying to understand gravity in, in, in general. Um, okay, so... Um, uh, oh, no, this doesn't work. I have to get used to that. Okay. So better, I'm going to put on my... should have already put on my timer, but I'm... So, an introduction to cosmological structure formation. So, I started by trying to make a little list of what I would like uh, an uninitiated listener. So, I'm assuming that you can be described as an uninitiated listener. Maybe some of you are not, but that most of you, uh, this is really not your, very far from your field and uh, of the things I want to take away. And I make a list. I won't, the list is in my notes, but I won't put it up. But basically, what I want to do is just get clear of what the problem is. So, the problem of cosmological structure formation. Okay, I just want you to get a uh, clear uh, uh, an idea of what the actual problem is. And uh, the second thing will be just to be clear that we're, why one can use a Newtonian approximation. And why, in fact, I'm not just setting h bar equal to zero, but I'm setting c equal to infinity. Okay? Um, why that is justified or at least going to tell you uh, rapidly why it's justified. And then I'm going to tell you about the, equa you know, the, the, the equations of motion. So what are the equations we're studying? It's Newtonian gravity, but with a very uh, important uh, uh, difference from the system of just n interacting bodies. In gravity, we have bodies, we're studying an infinite system in which particles are throughout an infinite space, and so that means that the equations of motion must take that into account, and that's what I'm going to explain. And then I'm going to say once, I'm going to say these are the equations, I'm going to tell you a little bit about initial conditions for this problem of structure formation. 
sketch briefly, just give you an idea where those come from, and then some results, basic results on dynamics. On dynamics. Because as I'm going to explain, this is not a problem. This is really a completely dynamical problem. It's not a problem where we have a thermodynamic equilibrium at all. And uh, so everything's about dynamics. Once we know what our equations are and what our initial conditions are, everything is fairly clear. And I'm just going to try and give some basic results. Tomorrow, I'm going to talk, or maybe I might, uh, beginning, depending on the time, I might uh, start today, uh, talk about a little bit already about results from uh, simulations and uh, try and explain in particular how cosmologists now understand the results of simulations or describe the results of simulations in particular in relation to what are called halos. And uh, there I'll try and make some connections to... to to things that have got to do with other long-range systems, okay? So my plan for that today is just, is there. And uh, so let me start. Um, oh, okay. Uh, so uh, the basis of modern cosmology is general relativity, okay? So as I'm going to explain, I'm actually not going to say very much about general relativity. In general relativity, when you consider a uniform density of mass, consider uh, in, in an infinite space, you obtain a well-defined solution for the metric. This is the so-called Friedman-Robertson-Walker metric, which describes, in particular, can describe contracting or expanding universes, but describes, apparently, the universe we live in. And it contains, it is really specified by a single function of time and a single constant, which tells you whether it's a so-called open uh, open, critical, or, or closed model, open, flat, or closed model. And so all there is in that model, there's the, in the metric, is basically this function called the scale factor. The scale factor tells you how the physical distance between two objects following in, in the, in, in, between uh, two objects in that uh, points, test masses in that metric, uh, changes as a function of time, and everything just gets scaled. So if you measure with a ruler the distance between two points, that grows as a function of time. Okay? So that's the basis of uh, the zero, that's the, the, the FRW solutions of gravity for an expanding universe. Of course, the real universe is not exactly uniform. It's not exactly homogeneous and isotropic. So what, how do we describe the real universe? The real universe we described as a perturbed FRW metric. So we have to generalize this metric with a single function to describe a perturbed metric. And it is that gravity is coupled through the Einstein equation to some perturbed matter energy content, which is the perturbed, the real matter uh, description, a more realistic description of the matter energy content in the universe. So in its simplest form, this leads to the standard cosmological model. I'm not going to go into details, but, oh, that doesn't work. I have to keep going back. Okay, the standard cosmological model in its absolutely minimal form is remarkably simple. Uh, you just need four parameters, so which give the density of radiation baryons. Baryons is all ordinary matter, protons and neutrons and so on, electrons as well. Uh, so-called dark matter and dark energy. These are the, the, the components, the, 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 the things that make up the energy of the universe according to the current standard model, but they're just four parameters. And then you need some parameters to give initial conditions to describe the fluctuations. Now, it turns out that in the simplest setting of this model, you can actually uh, uh, describe those initial conditions with only two parameters. I'm going to come back to that. So, remarkably... You know, you could, the whole pertur the, the, the perturbations in the energy density in the universe with some very simple assumptions, can, one can justify uh, them being fixed by only two parameters. You need all the standard physics of the, that is known in principle in the laboratory, particle physics, nuclear physics, various different, whatever, uh, standard physics of ordinary matter and some basic assumptions about the nature of the dark matter, and you have, in principle, predictions for the evolution of the universe, okay? So, um, this is the setting, and uh, the basic, the most important point is that the linear ver ver linearized version, so where we perturb the uh, Friedman, Robertson, Walker solutions and just consider just linear perturbations about that is a remarkably successful model. And basically, most of the successes of cosmology, uh, which you've surely heard about, 
have to do with this uh, particularly simple theoretical regime where everything is small and the equations are just linear equations describing the fluctuations about this universe, okay, about the, the, the uniform universe. So you've pr probably seen pictures like this. They're not even very up-to-date pictures. That's the so-called WMAP satellite. That's the Planck satellite. So what this is showing on a, is as a projection on the sky is showing variate the, the temperature of the microwave background of the microwave photons. Red is hot, you know, green, blue is cold. But the amplitude, the scale is not given there, but the amplitude of these fluctuations around the average temperatures of order 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. This is understood in the model as being the photons that have propagated to us from the time at which photons stopped interacting with the rest of the matter in the universe other than through gravity. And what we're seeing here in some ways is just a picture of the early universe. In the theory, the measure of these fluctuations allows you to reconstruct your density field basically at that time. Okay, it allows you to uh, infer what the fluctuations in all the fields were in the universe at that time. That time corresponds to a couple of hundred thousand years. And so this again is quite an out, this is the universe today in inverted commas. So this, each point here is a galaxy and uh, we're at the apex and we're looking at a kind of projection from above. Okay, we're looking at a kind of slice out of the universe, which is the slices related to the observational constraints. Uh, each point here is a galaxy and here you can see these large, by eye, these large structures, very large overdensities of galaxies in some regions, quite empty regions in between, and you see that there are huge fluctuations. Now, the scales at which you see very large fluctuations here correspond to scales that of a order a degree or below a degree in this scale, where in this map, where uh, the fluctuations of order 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5. So the problem of structure formation, you know, explained in a couple of minutes, uh, is that basically, how do you get from the tiny fluctuations in the primordial universe to the large fluctuations today? So what is the full quantitative theoretical prediction? So you need to have a theoretical prediction for the observations. And as I said, the linear theory is remarkably successful. The part that becomes less is less simple and more complex and therefore also less well understood is the part where the fluctuations are no longer small. So you have to, you have to explain these large fluctuations and that's the problem that I'm going to talk about. So, um, okay, there are, this is a tremendously complex problem in its full generality, but it undergoes over a large range of time and length scales a very uh, great, uh, great uh, several simplifying approximations, okay? So the simplification number one is that uh, the nonlinearity, so the fact that you can't treat things perturbatively, becomes important essentially in what we call the matter-dominated era. So the standard cosmology describes, you know, there's somewhere up here, there's an unknown big bang, there's something that's before the Friedman-Robertson-Walker phase or which starts the Friedman-Robertson-Walker cosmology. And then you have a period of time which is called radiation-dominated, where most of the energy density is in radiation. And because radiation ship, red shifts away, at some point you get to what's called equality, where matter and radiation are equal. And after that time, you get to matter domination. Now, this happens at a time that's not very different from the decoupling of the microwave background. It happens slightly before the decoupling of the microwave background. So this is at of order 100,000 years, something like that, slightly less. And uh, from then on, you live in the matter-dominated era until very close to us where perhaps something, the, the so-called dark energy can dominate. But for a very large time from then on, you're in the so-called matter-dominated era. And it's in this era that the nonlinearity develops for reasons that I'll explain uh, later. And uh, at that time, in this time, so the dynamics of the universe is dominated by matter, non-relativistic matter, and the perturbations are de developing in matter, which is non-relativistic. Okay? Uh, that, so that's a good approximation for the standard models. Further, uh, after this decoupling, so the decoupling when the photons, the radiation no longer interacts with the matter, the non-gravitational forces can be neglected at, at, at all but very small scales. Now I say by small scales, all, I mean 
certainly below galaxy scales. Where exactly the scale is, where you can neglect everything with gravity, is not, I would say, completely clear. It's conservative to say that certainly below, down to below gravity, of order gravity scales, certain galaxy scales, certainly we can neglect everything but gravity. And, okay, third simplifying assumption is that it turns out that the perturbed Friedman Robertson Walker metric, so the, the fact that we treat the metric as a perturbation about free, uh, as, as a perturbation from Friedman Robertson Walker, where the perturbation, so for, as a small perturbation from Friedman Robertson Walker, actually remains a good approximation right through this era at all but very, very small scales. At all of these scales, it's going to remain a good approximation for reasons that I will explain also a little bit later. So this basically means that you remain within a weak field approximation. So weak gravitational fields, non-relativistic limit, that corresponds to the Newtonian limit of the Newtonian limit of a purely self-gravitating system. So the problem of structure formation from this time, from right through the matter-dominated era, is actually really well approximated as a Newtonian problem. Right? It's the Newtonian limit of the full general relativistic treatment. Okay. So I just say very roughly the length scales that this means. So megaparsecs are the natural scale. I won't define length units here. I think uh, uh, megaparsecs are uh, ten to the six, ten, three by ten to the six light years, like three million light years is a megaparsec roughly. And uh, so you have uh, from galaxy scales, so from maybe one hundredth of a megaparsec to so-called horizon scales, where. Uh, the, the relativistic, the fact that you've got a finite speed of light becomes important. Uh, in that range of scales and in the range of time scales that are about, you know, very large range of time scales, five, five orders of magnitude, you have a Newtonian approximation that is extremely good for this problem. Okay? So this really is a real principle, with, you know, a, a real context in nature where gravity completely dominates and isn't uh, we, can, we can really treat the, this much, much simpler problem of just gravity and just Newton, okay? So what is the Newtonian limit? It's very easy for me to say you treat the Newtonian limit and that sounds obvious, but there's a, an important subtlety in that. What Newtonian limit are we talking about, okay? So in Friedman, Robertson, Walker, how do we get the Friedman, Robertson, Walker solution? We take a uniform distribution of mass throughout space. And that gives a solution in, in general relativity. In Newtonian gravity, it in fact does not give a solution. Newtonian gravity is not well defined. If I put mass everywhere in space, the, the Newtonian force is not well defined, right? It's just, you can trace, so as you can see that more, uh, so, you know, if we take the n-body system, Laying aside for a moment the, the issues about uh, singularities, if you just uh, allow that simplification that we, we don't discuss the singularities at small distances, okay, you can, if you like, assume there's some regularization. This problem is perfectly well defined, the Newtonian problem in a finite region of infinite space, okay, for a finite number of particles, so if you like a galaxy or something like that, it's perfectly well, stars in a galaxy, it's a very well defined problem. But when it's an infinite system, uh, the sum is badly defined, okay? So, what do you do? Well, what's the solution to this? The solution to this is, in fact, that general relativity prescribed tells you how you should regularize Newtonian gravity in order to obtain the equivalent, the, 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 the equivalent of the Friedman-Robertson-Walker solution from Newtonian gravity. If Newton, Newton had, you know, if this had been obvious, then you know, we would have probably would have it would have, uh, you know, uh, expanding universe cosmology would have been. Uh, existed, you know, might have existed several centuries ago. It's the fact that Newtonian gravity does not admit in an obvious way such a cosmological solution that the expansion of the universe, the discovery of that had to wait for general relativity in a certain sense. But in this particular case, so it's, a curiosity, it's, it's quite an important point that it is general relativity that tells you what the regularization is which, which uh, what the regularization is of Newtonian gravity. Whereas for any finite system, you know, the Newtonian limit of general relativity is always a well-defined thing. There's no ambiguity about it. 
So you need to regularize the Newtonian sum to obtain the Freeman Robson Walker solution. So how do you do that? Well, it's very simple. You do this, this is the way you derive if you do a pre, you know, if you do a course in cosmology without general relativity, this is the way you derive the cosmological solutions. You take, you know, matter distributed uniformly in space, okay? And now actually what you do is you take, you assume that you've got a ball. So you take a center, okay, and you calculate. So here, my, I take a sphere about a chosen center. That's R0 here, okay? I take a uh, point here. I take the sphere, and I say I'm gonna, that's the center of my universe. And now when I sum the force, I'm going to take uh, the sum by summing in spheres around that center. Okay, so the force on that point is clearly zero, okay, by symmetry, that's the way we've set it up. And then if you go and calculate the force on any other point, you can you now use Gauss's law. If I want to now calculate the force on that point, I'm gonna go in spherical, I maintain the spherical symmetry about that point, and I can work out by Gauss's law that the force is just four pi over three rho, if this vector is r or x, okay, that that direction that the force is that, okay? That's just Gauss's law. Now, once you've got that, you actually, if you take the uniform limit, okay, so you assume a uniform mass density, that gives you a, this force that is just proportional to the vector xi, okay? Rho of, so rho can then now be, also be a function of time. So there are then just scaling solutions in which we stretch the matter density, okay, we stretch the distance between particles by some factor which we call A of t, and we end up with this equation of motion for the, 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 the equation for A of t, which is in fact the same equation as in general relativity in the limit where you have matter domination, okay? So this uh, is the, the, the Friedman equation obtained, you know, from, that's the Newtonian limit of the, of the, of the sorry, the, the, the uh, the limit in which you obtain a cosmological solution, the regularization which which you obtain a cosmological solution, uh, which is the, the right cosmological solution, okay? Okay, so now what happens when we perturb the universe, okay? When we perturb the universe and want to uh, study the evolution of a perturbed universe, we use the same regularization. The Newtonian limit of the full problem corresponds to the same regularization, but now we're not going to have an exactly, uh, an, the, the matter distribution initially is not going to exactly follow the Hubble expansion, the, the, the stretching of the Hubble, uh, of, the, of, the, of the Friedman Robertson Walker solution, it's going to be deviated from that. Okay? So the, the, the infinite distribution of mass is close to uniform and close to Hubble flow above some finite scale. That's all. The above some finite scale is not so uh, important. I can come back to that. But basically, you're close to uniform and close to Hubble flow. And in that case, we go, it's convenient to treat the problem in what we call co moving coordinates. So the co moving coordinates are the coordinates in which particles following the expansion stay at rest. Okay? You just scale out the expansion, and then you get your x dot is just proportional to what you call the, the, the peculiar velocity. The peculiar velocity is the difference between the velocity of the particle and its velocity following in the Hubble flow. It's the difference between its real velocity and the f Hubble and the velocity in the, uh, in the expanding case, okay? In the uniform, in the, following the exact uh, expansion. So the, uh, so if this, we now have, so in these co-moving coordinates, it's very easy to show that you, the equations of motion, so the, the equations with the stars are basically the equations of motion for the problem of structure formation in the Newtonian limit. We have these, there's an inertia term, there's a kind of damping term, okay, which is the H is A dot over A, it's related to the expansion of, of the universe. So there's a, a damp, the dynamics is a damp dynamics, and then we have a regularized Newtonian force. Regularized Newtonian force means that you have basically removed in the, in the, in the divergence of the Newtonian force, which is, the, the, we've, we've, made the, the, we've removed the contribution from the background in the calculation of the Newtonian force. 
Now, for people who work on plasmas, the simplest way to say this is that actually all we're doing is, I'll just go forward. I mean, you can transfer into another set of coordinates, okay? You can go into a set of coordinates in which, by just changing the time variable, in which it's just a damped system with this regulated, regulated gravitational force, okay? Those are the equations of motion for the n particles. The regulated force is the gravitational force minus the contribution from the background. Now, for people who work in plasmas, maybe the simplest way I can say that is that what we have in practice is the dynamics of the jellium model. It's exactly like the jellium model. In the jellium model, you have charges of uh, electrons, say, and then you have a uni uniform background, okay? The uniform background here has been put in by the expansion, if you like. That's where the uniform background comes from. And you've just got a damping as well. So it's like you change, take the jellium model, change the sign from, attractive, from repulsive to attractive, and you add a damping term, and that's the dynamics, you're, the dynamics of that system that you're studying, okay? So that's the, where am I here? So I'm already somewhere here, not doing too badly. Maybe I should stop. Okay, there are various different ways that you can r write this formally. You can write the sum in various different ways. The way I think is nice is there's a nice article by Kiesling where he explains that you can actually write this in this way. I think that's actually a very nice physical way to write it. What you've done is you've taken a screening of the Newtonian force and you've sent the screening to infinity. That's the way you've regularized the problem. Okay? This is related to what's called the genes. It also can be called what's called the gene swindle in astrophysics. Kiesling insists, and I think correctly insists, on the fact that it's not a swindle. It's something that can be well formulated mathematically in this way, and that it really just does correspond to taking the screen. So again, just to say that taking the screen potential, it means I sit on a particle, I screen uh, in a symmetric way about myself, so that kills the contribution from the mean density. Okay? I go on every point, and every point, is, its force is zero in the, unif in the limit of a uniform density, okay? So the source, the force is only sourced, if you write in terms of the potential, the source is only forced by the density fluctuations, okay? Okay, so that's the problem. Uh, maybe, okay, uh, maybe I should stop for questions. Does anybody want to ask a question about that? Uh, it's, the mu is this, you see, so when I, I sent, mu is a parameter that I sent to zero. I regulate Newtonian gravity. I regularize the Newtonian force. I prescribe how to calculate it by putting a screening on, on Newton's potential and then sending the screening to infinity. And that tells me how to calculate the Newtonian force. So you, you, you send it to zero. zero. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. In practice, we're always going to, when this is calculated, you actually look at an infinite periodic system, right? It's not, you don't ever calculate an in, with an infinite distribution of particles. It's an infinite periodic system. Yeah. Uh, is it sure that? Yeah. That's a difficult question. I don't... <laughs> Is it, is it sure that different regularization schemes give the same result? That these different regularization schemes dif give the result or that all regularization schemes give the same? No, I mean, I think you can come up probably with different regularization schemes, but there are, it's equivalent to the standard EVA, for example, in the case of, I don't know if you know, if you come from the context where you know the Jellian model, you calculate an infinite periodic system of charges and you calculate using the so-called eval sum, and you subtract, you break the sum into a nearby part and a far away part, and then the far away part, you subtract the k equal to zero mode, basically. So that, so there are many open questions about that, so I, maybe I can't give a, I, maybe if you want to, we can discuss it. There's, there, there are actually um, I, I, um, lots of open questions about how well things are defined. It's a, so, I don't have a short answer to your question. I can't say no rigorously. All regularizations are the same. I, I'm not. They're, they're, they're open questions. Any other questions before we go? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. In the sense that when you do this regularization, you obtain a solution of the Newtonian problem, 
which corresponds to the uh, to the um, to the uh, general relativistic solution. I mean, you 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 when you interpret again, there's there are subtleties in this. Maybe it's not uh, uh, you you when I write, you know, r equal to a t of x. Okay. Um, this, so what the solution, when I regularize this way and I take a uniform density, I obtain uh, particles that are going to be, whose physical distance is going to uh, scale as a function of time in this way, okay? And that's, in principle, that's the same behavior as the, what you would identify as the Newtonian limit of freeman robinson walker solutions. When you take two particles, and you take them, uh, and you neglect effects that are to do that are that are purely relativistic to do with the finiteness of the speeds of light, the horizon, and so on. When you take a physical length scale, it actually does change as a function of time. No, well, I, here again, I think there's something. That, that this is a point that I, I, you know, I don't know if it's exhaustively, rigorously understood either. You know, it's just that when you look at bounded mass distributions, what you mean by the U Newtonian limit is completely un unambiguous. But when you take an infinite mass distribution, uh, you need general relativity to tell you what the right limit is, and it, there is no unambiguous. You know, so. Okay, so the, 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 the equations are those, okay? So now I'm going to go on. Uh, just one important point about, and this is related, maybe a little bit related actually to what you're saying, okay? So over the question. This is what we call the physical coordinate, okay? This was the original coordinate in which we wrote down the equations of motion. Then we changed to these other coordinates, okay? These are called co-moving coordinates. Now, when we study the problem, we're going to study it in co-moving coordinates. But the, the, these physical coordinates have a real physical meaning, which is what? The physical meaning that remains of these coordinates is that, imagine now we have our particles following this Newtonian expansion, okay? And imagine, imagine now that we consider a small a subsystem. So we consider a subsystem of this expanding universe, okay? We consider, we just say, that's a subsystem, okay? Now, if you analyze the forces acting on the particles in that system, okay, you can break it up into three places. You can say the force on the particle is the force on the central mass plus the difference of the force acting on, on the two particle uh, on this point and on the center of mass. And the point, the piece coming uh, f uh, from the relative force to the relative central mass can be broken up into two bits. It can be broken up into the forces acting coming from the mass inside the sphere and the, the forces coming from the stuff that's very far away. The force, if we now imagine that we, imagine you contract this, you make this a very dense system and you make a hole around it, okay? When you do that, you make the tidal forces coming from other matter negligible compared to the internal forces. And you can show, by, in this way, you can show that uh, the equations of motion for this substructure, for this overdense, isolated substructure inside the expanding universe, that they actually, the equations of motion of the particles there just are the equations of motion in physical coordinates of an isolated system. So what's the importance of that? The importance of that is imagine I have a, I have the, the solar system. Imagine that's, the, I've picked out the points that correspond to the solar system. The solar system is, is, is isolated and dense compared to the background. The, the equations of motion in physical coordinates of the points in the solar system with respect to its center of mass are just those of an isolated system. So if we've got an elliptical orbit, that orbit is going to, it's good, the planet is going to remain on the elliptical orbit in physical coordinates. And that means that in co-moving coordinates, it's going to remain fixed in this. In co-moving coordinates, it's going to shrink. It's going to go as 1 over A, right? So if you look in co-moving coordinates and then you identify a bound system, it's going to remain fixed in physical coordinates. It doesn't follow the Hubble flow. So you may have asked yourself that question, where does the Hubble flow stop? Right? Why don't do stars and galaxies? Does the moon is the moon uh, you know following Hubble expansion? No, it's not following Hubble expansion. It's fixed in physical coordinates, right? And that's so the physical coordinates are really those coordinates in which you can take the system and treat it as if it's isolated, 
if it's sufficiently overdense. Okay, so that's where you will recover. You will recover the treatment, the behavior of an isolated system, and you can start act, asking about quasi-stationary states, and all the questions are the same as for an isolated system. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, so I've like 20 minutes, something like that. Okay, so dynamics. So what do we know about the dynamics? Uh, so in pre this is, uh, just I'll go over this rapidly. Uh, I wrote down equations for particles. In cosmology, we're interested, the particles are microscopic. The number of particles is effectively infinite compared on any scale that we're interested in describing the problem. So in cosmology, what we do is, we believe, sorry, that should really be Vlasov Newton following what, uh, the, 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 what, uh, what uh, Julien said this morning. So how do we derive these? So we're basically assuming that we're, we're going to derive our physical problem in, these Vlasov, uh, for the, in the limit where the Vlasov-Newton equations are valid and that the same conditions have to be valid as are used for finite systems. Okay? And we just do exactly, we can write down these equations in physical coordinates and then do transformation to co-moving coordinates. And in co-moving coordinates, we get... Uh, Vlasov, Poisson, Vlasov, Newton equations, collisionless Boltzmann, as, as Julien said in, in cosmology, uh, people usually, in astrophysics, people usually talk about the collisionless Boltzmann equation, uh, and it has this slightly modified form. So what you have there, you have, uh, you know, you have the usual terms, and then you have your force terms, uh, and, but the force is calculated from this regulated, you know, we've subtracted the mean density, and that's all. And there's a damping term as well, okay? So the most simple thing you can do uh, is to treat this perturbatively is to go to fluid equations. So you take the first moment of the vlasov poisson equation, that gives you a continuity equation. Uh, the second moment gives you, sorry, the first moment, so integrating D3V uh, uh, by the first moment D3V V, I get the Euler equation. Now, if you neglect the velocity dispersion term, so uh, Julien mentioned this, this is exactly the case that we work with most of the time in cosmology, where at least initially the matter is cold. That means we can neglect the velocity dispersion and assume that the matter just has a bulk velocity, initially at least. Okay? And if you linearize in the mass density fluctuations and in the bulk velocity, so you, you, if you linearize in those parameters, you get a very simple set of equations which is just, you know, the first is just a continuity equation, the second is the Euler equation, where you see the force coming from the regularized, regularized force, and you can see that the potential, you see, is sourced by the density fluctuation rather than the density, okay? And uh, so if you analyze in, in two minute, in one minute, you can show that, but I won't take the one minute, but it's very simple to show that if you just write down, you eliminate U from these equations, you take a second, you take a gradient of this equation and you, you, you just you eliminate uh, delta, uh, you find, a, you find a, the, the, the equation for delta, delta is a linear, there's a linear equation, second order linear equation for delta, it has a growing mode and it has a decaying mode, but most important it has a growing mode, the density fluctuations grow, okay, and you get uh, therefore what's called uh, linear amplification for the case of a matter-dominated cosmology, which is the one I'm talking about, you just get a simple amplification in time. A of t is the scale factor. The universe is expanding. I didn't write down the time dependence, but you, I, can't, I don't need it here. So the density fluctuations just grow with A of t in Fourier space likewise. And the, so the amplification of the density fluctuation is scale independent, and this is very particular, this is because of gravity, this is a property of gravity, if you take any other potential, that's not going to be true, it's a property of Newtonian gravity, and uh, if you look at the peculiar velocity field, so the, 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 what we call the, 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 this U is the bulk peculiar velocity, the bulk velocity with respect to the Hubble flow, it obeys this equation, it also gets amplified, and the important point is that the source term, because the source term is gravity, right? Sorry, because the source term is gravity, gravity basically U in the linear, the, the field U actually in the growing mode is just parallel to the gradient, is to the force, and therefore it's an irrotational flow, right? The velocity is irrotational because the velocity is the gradient of a scalar field, okay? So you get irrotational flow and it, Importantly, this comes, importantly, if you look now, 
delta, okay, scales with A. Rho zero, is, it's the, mean, the, the density in co-moving coordinates. It doesn't, it's not a depend, it doesn't depend on time. Delta grows with A, but you see there's a factor of A on the bottom, so those cancel out. So the density fluctuations grow, but the gravitational fluctuations do not grow. They remain constant. And that's the reason why we actually remain within the Newtonian approximation. The amplification in this expanding universe of the density fluctuations does not actually ampl amplify the gravitational potential. So the gravitational potential starts small, it can stay small, but the density fluctuations get large. And the re why is that? It's kind of counterintuitive, maybe. It's because the density, you have the density fluctuations growing, but this factor of one over A, it comes from the stretching of the universe. The fact that it's being stretched, the gravitational potential is actually being lowered by the stretching, and there's a compensating factor coming from the growth of the density fluctuations, and it means the gravitational potential does not actually grow, okay? So that's why Newton remains. Otherwise, if, New if the Newtonian potential blew up, you would go, you wouldn't be in Newton, you couldn't make, and it's that underlying behavior that explains why the gravity remains, it remains a good approximation to treat gravity as uh, uh, Newtonian. Okay, so linear amplification, I finished with that. Okay, that's, maybe I'll skip over that, that's a thing called the Zeldovich approximation, it's another way of stating, uh, of giving this linear theory. Okay, I want to see a little bit, oh, I'm getting a bit behind now, aren't I? So I better hurry up on the last few bits. Okay, initial conditions. So we're going to discuss, so the equations that we've written down, they become valid here, okay? Once you're into the matter-dominated era, those are the equations of motion for uh, the development of structure in the universe. The question is, what are the initial conditions here, okay? So, Basically, what cosmologists do, what cosmologists, theoretical cosmologists uh, do, is they uh, invent uh, or discover, I don't know, scenarios in which you can generate initial conditions back here in the primordial universe, right at the beginning of the Freeman Robertson Walker phase, and that has to be described some way theoretically. So what the 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 what you do is you get initial conditions here. The initial conditions so you have some physical process in the primordial universe, so somewhere back here, in the, somewhere where we, things we, uh, become, uh, can, can be described using you know, uh, the, uh, quantum field theory or whatever, using, using, using a, in a completely different limit to the one that we're describing, you have a physical process which could be so-called inflation, okay, for example, uh, in which you generate low amplitude metric matter energy fluctuations here, okay? And these fluctuations are, no matter what the physical process is, they're described as realizations of a stochastic process. So you have some fields describing matter and energy in the universe, and you have some stochastic realization of a stochastic process which has given properties. It's usually assumed to be Gaussian, and uh, from, so you have some Gaussian all the fields are given by some Gaussian uh, process here. They evolve through in time. The, rate, the, the evolution in this phase remains, here you have to use, you can't just use Newton's gravity, you really use, need to use the full relativistic equations, but those are not very difficult equations. There's just a lot of them, but they're just linear equations because the perturbation theory is good. You can evolve from here to here using the full equations of general relativity, and you get some output. And that output is the input for the problem of structure formation. Okay, so, um, so at this time, we're go what we get is we have some matter den density. Okay, what we're going to, what we're describing is the evolution of the density, matter density. At this time, we have a matter density which can be written as th in this way as a realization there's some density field, which is a realization of a correlated Gaussian process, and there is a velocity a single flow because this growing there's this growing mode of the velocity field. You just have a single uh, velocity. Uh, you have the approximation that you have a single velocity, bulk velocity at each point in space is a very good approximation, and everything is characterized by what's called the power spectrum. So the power spectrum, probably most you know, or structure factor, you know, power is basically the Ensemble. If this is the ensemble average of the delta, delta so we have the delta density fluctuation field, and this is the 
Fourier transform, and the variance of that is the power spectrum. And so it gives you just the variance of the power, in e the variance of the fluctuations in each mode, and so it, everything is given by this function, okay? So the function, I'll just go through rapidly. Okay, maybe I won't go, I'll jump some of those details. You get a function like that. A cosmologist will give you a function like that for the power spectrum the so-called linear power spectrum at the beginning of the matter-dominated phase. So that's going to be the input from cosmology for this Newtonian problem, okay? The part at small k, so this is in k, so these are large scales, okay? On the left, these are the large scales. They, this form here corresponds to the so-called primordial spectrum. So these are the large scales that are not really affected much by the non-trivial physics during the radiation era while these ones are the ones where you can see, depending on the parameters of the cosmological model, you get a slightly different spectrum, okay? So you get something different depending on the model. But that's not the subject of our, the subject of our interest. I'm just saying that all we get for the cosmological problem is such an initial input at the beginning of the matter dominant phase for a Newtonian problem, okay? So, um, maybe I'll jump that. I just want to say one thing about the power spectrum that's important, I mean, is that basically, if you call, if you take a sphere of radius R, okay, and you look at the average mass fluctuation, normalized mass fluctuation, delta M over M, in a sphere of radius R, and you look at how it depends on the radius, to a very good approximation that is given just as K cubed times the power spectrum, or just as A over R to the 3 plus N, if you have a if you have an N in the parallel. So if N is larger, you have fluctuations that are decreasing faster. The important thing about cosmological models is that this function, so the variance of density fluctuations as a function of scale, is a monotonically decreasing function. Okay, that's what the initial condition has that property. So you could imagine that it could have any form you like, you know, out of inflation, you could, you know, you could get bizarre things, but in the standard cosmological model, you have the variances as a function of scale that basically look, you know, your variance of your fluctuations, your delta squared R, which is just equal to delta squared R. So this would be the, the averaged fluctuation in the mass on the scale R is something, you know, some decreasing function, and if this is log log, it's a function that looks like that. It's a monotonically decreasing function, okay? So that's an important property. Okay, so in a few minutes I've left, I'm just gonna say, and then I can continue with this, uh, I will continue with this tomorrow and, and also talk about the results of uh, simulations. Um, and so, from the linear to the nonlinear regime. So the linear regime is the regime in which the density fluctuations are so small that you can use this fluid, linearized fluid approximation, right? And when that breaks down, you go into the nonlinear regime, okay? So the linear theory, the, I underlined that the most impressive observational successes of the standard cosmological model are in this linear regime, okay? So despite its simplicity, there's a huge amount of all the fluctuations in the CMB and everything is basically described by this. And importantly, I'm not going to talk about it, one of the most interesting, impressive observations of the last, like, uh, it was the first measures made about 10 years ago, but you, if you hear talks on cosmology, you will hear people talking about these baryon acoustic oscillations, where in galaxy correlations, at a scale of 100 megaparsecs, roughly, they, which is a huge scale, they measure a slight uh, feature in the correlation function, so there's some kind of correlation between galaxies at very large scales that is maintained through cosmological history, and that is described in the regime where linear theory is still good, and that's extraordinarily successful. So I'm not going to talk about that. That is the linear, rather theoretically, relatively very straightforward part. What I'm going to talk about is the nonlinear part at smaller scales. So um, when does linear theory break down? Okay, so the criterion for the validity of linear theory is, in general, if you ask yourself, I put down some fluctuations, is linear theory valid? Obviously, you have to go and look at the nonlinear terms and see, are they small compared to the linear, you know, are they going to dominate the linear evolution? 
And the answer to that, so there's no general answer to that question. It's not simple. It depends on the whole spectrum of fluctuations. It's like any, I suppose, linearized approximation. It's very hard to give the exact criteria for, you, you can give approximate criteria, but to know exactly when it's going to break down in general is, you know, can't be determined unless you go and really do the nonlinear problem. But roughly what you can say is that linear theory is valid for density or velocity fields smoothed on some scale R, right? So we smooth the density scale on some, um, we take our density field, we can smooth it on, on any scale we like, okay? We scale, smooth it in the sphere of size R. And basically, if the density and flu velocity fluctuations are small at that scale and at larger scales, so that's gonna be true because we have a mon monotonically decreasing uh, fluctuations, then linear theory will work to describe those scales. What that says, so why is that true? But this is true basically provided you can neglect the effect of small scales on larger scales, okay? It's an assumption about neglecting the coupling from, of the small scales to the large scales. And what it, it's, there is no general proof of it, but if you take a simple power spectrum, there are arguments, uh, very general physical, very convincing arguments given by Zeldovich and uh, also Peebles, which say that so long as you have a spectrum that's not too uh, blue, that doesn't have too much power concentrated at small scales, then you're okay. Linear theory is going to work and you can forget about the effect of the small scales on the large scales, okay? And that is true for cosmological models. So for cosmological models, basically, okay, linear theory is going to remain true. So that was the, so that was the important point to take. The linear evolution at a given scale is then negligibly affected by nonlinear fluctu fluctuations at smaller scales. So then you have something very simple. You say, this is my, imagine I smooth the density field on some, I, this is as a function of, of scale. Now the linear theory, imagine I smooth, the, 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 the lower scale here, I start at some very small amplitude, right? I've, at the initial time, I've chosen my scale here so that this amplitude is small, okay? And then, so the density fluctuations are small on every scale. Linear theory works. Linear theory is just gonna amplify that in time, okay? So when we get linear theory is gonna break down when the density fluctuations reach some value, okay? So if you go to this time, linear theory is gonna have start breaking down there. If you go here, linear theory is gonna break down here. So you get a growing scale of nonlinearity. The system goes nonlinear at a scale that increases in time. So you start at a particular, you know, with density fluctuations that's small, and progressively the smallest scales go nonlinear, then the next scale goes nonlinear, then the next scale goes nonlinear, okay? And uh, this is what's called, uh, okay, this is, that's what I just said, I think. So that, uh, the linear theory itself then prescribes a scale at which the linear theory breaks down. You can show in simple cases that it just, you can work out its scaling behavior. So for co-matter, this is all for co-matter with cosmological spectra, this gives rise to what you call hierarchical structure formation, okay? You get a monotonically growing nonlinearity scale driven by linear amplification, and the time of nonlinearity from each scale is independent of all others. So it's, there's, it's very, non, it's not trivial that really you're saying that each scale goes nonlinear at a time that only depends on the initial fluctuation on that scale. It doesn't depend on anything else. And these, assuming these behaviors of the density fluctuations, each scale just lives on its own until it goes nonlinear. Right? You can smooth the system and look at some scale. It just lives on its own until it, goes, it hits nonlinearity. And uh, so you get a successive collapse, of, a successive independent collapse of scales, okay? Now, given that I'm, okay, I should stop for questions. I maybe will cut there for until tomorrow. I can start there tomorrow. It's a little bit less than where I expected. I just show you, just to give you already, you know, result of some cosmological simulations. Maybe it helps to visualize, uh, you know, this is a cosm, just to give you, this is a simple power. So what is this? This is an initial, um, it's a cube, right, projected or it's part of a project, actually, don't take, we don't project the whole cube. It's, a, so Q, it's, we're going to, it's an infinite periodic universe, okay, and this is our periodic uh, cell. It contains, I don't know, uh, six, 64 cube particles or something. It's not a huge simulation. You can, I think it's 64, 64. And the particles, to have been moved from their initial condition, 
in a way that corresponds to some power spectrum, right? And the velocities are as these, in these growing mode velocities, okay? I'll come back to it a little, I'll explain this more tomorrow. But just give you, so what happens? If we evolve this in time, what do we see? We see structures developing, okay? And uh, developing then, that's further in time, developing at larger scales, okay? So you have, if you look even at this, if you went and coarse grained all the small scale structure out of that, if you took all the nonlinear structures out of that and then evolved it forward, you would still get the bigger nonlinear structures than this. You see, it's really each scale is independent. The, the, the scales that the, the structures that are forming here are not forming because the structures inside them collapsed. They're forming a structure at a particular point. The big structure at a particular point will form because there was a fluctuation in the initial condition. Okay? So if you go back, if you looked at, it's hard to see by eye, but there are, if you can trace the correlation between where the structures formed and the initial conditions. All the information about where the structure forms is in the initial conditions. Okay? And this is what you, as I say, what you call hierarchical structure formation. Okay, I'll stop there for today I, I, and I'll give you another, uh, I'll continue tomorrow, <laughs> maybe.